Hello and welcome to today's video and I could not be more excited to introduce you to an incredible guest and that is of course Sean Wallace, notorious for his role as the professional quizzer or the chaser in ITV's hit quiz show The Chase. Thank you Sean. Good for joining me Sam. today. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Now, for everybody watching out there, we're not actually in a studio. We are in Sean's chambers. Yes. Now, a lot of you may not know, but Sean is, in actual fact, a full-time criminal defence barrister. That's Sean, correct. please tell me how you went from doing this to being one of the most recognised personalities on TV right now. Um, it really started... Back in the late 90s, actually, when my career was sort of going through a, a bit of a slump and I wanted to do something completely different. And I thought to myself, uh, you know, what could I do? And uh, I just thought, be a uh, quiz show competitor. Quiz show competitor, what, on TV? Yeah, on TV, yeah. So I started initially on a show called 100% uh, on Channel 5. Then I really got the taste for it. Then I did 15 to 1, The Weakest Link. And uh, my breakthrough uh, in terms of success on a quiz show was a show called Greed, where between us we won a quarter of a million pounds. Fantastic. Now, you're known as the Dark Destroyer That's correct, on yes. the show. Yeah. Now, did the name come from, uh, was it inspired by Nigel Benn, the professional boxer? Is well, there some truth in that? Say? Well, well Bra it was Bradley who um, That's Bradley you know, gave Walsh. me, yeah, Bradley Walsh gave me the, uh, the nickname because originally I was called the Legal Eagle, obviously uh, in reference to my sort of uh, legal career. Then he started to call me the sort of Dark Destroyer, obviously in reference to the great middleweight boxing champion, Nigel Benn. And I was a bit apprehensive at first because of the fact that I didn't want to be seen to be actually taking his name. And I thought, you know, let me avoid Nigel just in case he gives me a right hand <laughs> for sort of stealing his name. <laughs> the whole show, uh, as I say, from behind the scenes, we're one great big family. So from the runner right up to the host, you know, we treat each other with respect. Uh, and it's a fun show to work in. It doesn't seem like a chore. You know, we're one big happy family. Uh, you know, the uh, executive producers, Helen, Martin, and uh, uh, the great man, Michael Kelpie, you know, they've always been supportive of us as chasers. I was the first chaser appointed in 2008, and, uh, you know, I knew that the show was going to be a phenomenal success, uh, but I never envisaged in my wildest dreams that, uh, you know, this year we'd be celebrating our 10th anniversary. Oh, fantastic. And you've also, last year, you also begun work on the Australian version of The Chase, is yeah, that right? that's correct, yeah. Fantastic. They invited me down under to uh, Melbourne. It was just a wonderful experience. It was the first time I've actually been to Australia, and I was treated with uh, uh, love, uh, um, support and uh, you know adoration it was just fantastic yeah and you guys are incredibly humble as well I always find you complimenting and championing each other whenever I see yeah your because uh, you know one of the things uh, uh, when I first became a chaser and both myself and Mark did the initial pilot back in June 2009 the first thing we said to each other is that we've got to respect each other's abilities because mm. once you start having egos then it's going to create division resentment and you know that's not what the show is all about so every chase who's come on first Dan, then Paul, then Jenny, they bought into that ethos. And you know, we, we uh, respect each other, we support each other. And I think that transmits itself onto the way in which us as individual chasers uh, perform on the show. Fantastic. And talking about your sort of humble ethos, you, of course, won um, Mastermind in 2004, which that's I think correct. is incredible. Yeah. I think that's just yeah. amazing. With zero passes. That's correct. Yeah, the only time I pass is when I'm playing football. <laughs> I was the first black person uh, to apply for the show. Uh, I mean, the show had been going since 1972, and I've always been a big fan of the show. And... Um, you know, um, they say procrastination is a thief of time because I always wanted to do the show. And uh, when they took the show off in 1997, because, you know, quizzing had lost its luster, you know, they took off yeah. um, a university challenge in the same decade as well. And I thought my chance had gone. Uh, then quizzing became cool again in the uh, noughties. Uh, when they revived uh, uh, Mastermind, I remember going, I remember at the time I uh, uh, was recovering from a, a, an injured leg uh, from playing football. And I remember seeing Andy Page, the 2003 winner of the, the recently revamped show, holding the trophy, and I thought, oh, I wish that could be me. Oh, wow. And I looked at it, and I thought to myself, right, apply. And it changed my life. No, absolutely. And, and here we are mm. today. You've got, obviously, an autobiography that you've just re uh, released. Yeah, it's called Chasing the Dream. And yeah. we'll be talking about that in more detail in a little while. But mm. again, uh, going back to your quiz and your knowledge and how much you've accumulated, mm. you also, I think you mentioned in there, your, uh, you, that Piers Morgan enlisted your help as well. For yeah, the yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, Piers invited me on to his show at, uh, uh, in mid-December. So it was wonderful seeing him and Susanna Reid. 
And uh, what happened, I'm glad Pierce actually <laughs> told, uh, you know, the uh, uh, truthful version in relation to how we be became uh, <laughs> friends, if I could put it that way, because I was sitting at home in 2005, just towards the end of June 2005, I get a phone call at home. So, are you Sean Wallace? I said, yeah. He goes, this is Piers Morgan. I said, Piers Morgan, who just uh, used to work for the Daily Mirror. He oh, goes, God. Because yeah. yeah. he'd just been uh, um, released, if I can use that expression. So I said, what do you want? So he was a bit taken aback, and he basically explained. Uh, then I was a bit indignant how he got my number as well. So he then spent the next 40 seconds persuading me to take part in the quiz. And at that time, I'd retire from quizzing, you know, because obviously winning Mastermind is the sort of pinnacle of all quiz shows. I thought to myself, well, where else can I go? Yeah. So uh, he then spent another 40 seconds, because I said, look, I'm not doing it. I'm not, I've retired, that's it. Then when Singh mentioned um, Jeremy Paxman, who I've always wanted to meet, and Jeremy Paxman was going to be the host, I said, you know Fantastic. what? Fantastic. All right, I'll do it. And where was this quiz? It was in the Riverside Cafe in uh, Hammersmith. And it was, you know, the... Uh, entertainment glitterati, the who's who, from Stephen Fry to Sebastian Folks, and the advantage I had, or the team had, is that they didn't know who I was. Yeah. Uh, uh, and the So they couldn't watch their backs. Yeah, they didn't know, who, you know, I was the only black guy in there, and they, they just did not know who I was. I remember at half time, and we, you know, we were well in touch with the leaders. I remember when Stephen Fry, who I, you know, got to know quite well, and Sebastian Folks came up to me, because they were both in the same team, and they said to me, you know, hello, what's your name? So I said, well, Sean, so thinking that they would have realised I was a reigning mastermind champion yeah. again the penny didn't drop <laughs> they said well how do you know Piers I said oh just name around and yeah. I just left them uh, then uh, you know going into the final round I think because uh, Piers' uh, main rival uh, was the former uh, Guardian producer Adam Rusbridger. Okay. Uh, and uh, you know they always wanted to deny Piers his uh, 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 you know reigning title no he, he never won oh, that quiz never so at he, all. He, yeah so that's why he brought me in to, uh, so <laughs> We just smashed it. Oh, so wow. he wrote about it in his autobiography. So when I wrote my autobiography and I told him, I met him at the NTA Awards about three years ago, I said, Piers, you're going to be in my book, mate. And uh, <laughs> once I've, uh, I've written it and published it, I'm going to come on your show to talk about it. Oh, fantastic. So I sent him a copy in advance and he read it, loved it. And uh, yeah, we didn't make it ever since. That's incredible. Now your, I mean, your role as a dark destroyer obviously involves competing against a normal the average sort of normal yeah. people yeah. i mean i know when i watch it i mean i couldn't do this job not your job not because i haven't got your level of iq i think that may take some time but i just couldn't do because i'd actually feel really sorry for the no, people that are losing no, i'm not interested in that so that's really. what i want to know how do you say so they they lose anything i think twenty seven thousand pounds like well, well, all I, sorts of I, amounts I, I, of I, money you, you, you know the best victory i've had was when i beat a team um <laughs> You know, with a one second to go, I snatched a hundred thousand pounds. Hundred thousand. Do you not feel anything at that moment when you just think? Absolutely not. Absolutely You're just. Not. But in saying that, <laughs> I'm the only chaser who will go and see the contestants after the show, whether they win or lose. Really? Yeah, and I'll what do you do? That. What do you just apologise? No, no, no. Give them a big Sorry. hug. Uh, you know, Aww. because uh, you know, you know, to congratulate if they beat me. If they beat me, it's fantastic. If they lose, then you know, it's all a big team hug for the team. And I basically say to them. It takes courage to face a professional quiz. Of course, it does. So you know, if they if they come onto the show and they leave with something, all power to their over, and that's why I'm there to actually uh, congratulate them. Take what do you think the biggest defeat's been for you on the show? Oh, I, I've had uh, in last year on the uh, it was the celebrity show on the soccer aid. I lost one hundred sixty thousand pounds. One hundred sixty thousand pounds. Yeah. Oh God! Yeah. So you, what do you do? Just go away and then get over it the next day, and yeah. off you go Got again. It. I don't, I don't like to lose, but you know, it's just like falling off a bike. You just sort of dust yourself up and just get back on the bike and start pedaling. You must have a tremendous work ethic to do what you do. So as well as having to revise for all these quizzes. Yeah. Um, I've read, obviously, that you actually go and socialise at least once a month with the other chasers and do a GCSE paper. Yeah, because, I mean, we take part in a uh, sort of, uh, it's a Great British quiz. Uh, I, I don't do it as often as I uh, uh, like like Paul, because, I mean, Paul uh, Sinner is one now turned into one of the best quizzes in the world. Fantastic. Uh, so I go along occasionally because, as I say, you know, there are not enough hours in the day. Uh, um most weekends I'm either hosting a quiz or taking part in a quiz. Um, so, you know, when I do have time, I'll, I'll go along to those quizzing Grand Prix. But, uh, and you yeah. travel internationally, don't you, or around at least yeah. nationally? I mean, later on uh, uh, this evening, uh, this weekend, I'm going to Dorset to host a charity quiz on Friday night and Saturday night. And what I normally do when I, with my quizzes, 
I normally buy a trophy and medals, you know, first, second and third, and they just really love it. So I set the questions and it's just a fantastic time. And the reception I get from the people when I go around the country is fantastic. Amazing. Now, I wanted to go back a bit in time and go back to how this all started for you. Mm. Uh, obviously, you just haven't got to where you are today without, I'm assuming, some incredible support behind you. Absolutely. As I said, in my, I said in my autobiography in the foreword, uh, no man is an island. No successful person can basically say, I did it on my own. And uh, uh, I attribute my success. Obviously, you've got to have the talent and the hard work to actually do it. But... Uh, if it wasn't for the support of uh, my teachers uh, over the years who basically supported the dream of a young 11 year old boy who wanted to be a barrister, my mum and dad who were there at my proudest moments, especially when I got called to the bar in 1984, uh, my eldest sister who gave me the sort of, my eldest sister Sandra who gave me the sort of um, passion for learning and realising that uh, you know education is the key and I owe her a great deal and uh, you know my kid brother Steve um, who I love dearly. So my family uh, and, and dearest close friends who have been there from the start and will be there to the end, uh, uh, they have been the fuel which has uh, helped me keep going. Well, I mean, I know as part of that journey, you've actually been a lecturer as well. You go to yeah. prison, you visit prisons yeah, I, and schools. Yeah, and... I taught uh, at Hackney College uh, for 14 years, wow. four nights a week. Because I always thought that as a black professional, uh, it was important to try and put something back to try and inspire the next generation of people irrespective of age, irrespective of gender, irrespective of disability uh, to try and reach your own green dreams and ambitions. And the greatest philosophy um, I have uh, is, uh, you know, chase your own dreams, set your own goals, but people should be there to help you. And I always talk about the ladder of opportunity should be down for everybody. And the one thing with being in a public life like I, like I am now, uh, with fame does come responsibility and a lot of people uh, who are famous uh, have a tendency to actually want to keep fame for themselves uh, and are basically uh, jealous in relation to the competition which they may face. Yeah. Uh, but the one thing I always say about uh, fame, and, uh, and I'm philosoph philosoph philosophical about this, uh, listen, I'm today's news, I'm tomorrow's to your papa. Yeah. Uh, and if fame goes, uh, I've had a great time. Uh, because I'm a lawyer first who happens to be on TV, not the other way around. Are there any words of wisdom that you have for young people out there who potentially could be watching this? We have obviously, at the moment, we've got the issues of a lot of child uh, yeah. murders at the moment, one as recently as, yeah. as last week. Mm. Um, where is it that you think we're going wrong? What is it we can do differently? You know, I'm not going to basically say I've got the panacea for uh, all uh, uh, the ills of the world. I'm not going to basically say that I know precisely what the reason is why uh, uh, we have this sort of, uh, you know, uh, chaos on the soil, especially in relation to uh, our, our youth of today. But the one thing which I always try to do, especially uh, uh, going to schools, uh, primary schools in particular, you know, because when they see me, people are in awe of me. Uh, and I want people to realise, look, I, you know, one thing I say to young children is, this, listen, I used to be like you once. I used to be sort of, you know, wide-eyed and sort of, you know, really excited at seeing somebody who took time out to come to their school and, you know, is famous and well-known. And uh, I say to them, listen, you could be me. You yeah. could be better than me. I'm not going to be here forever. And somebody's got to be the next chaser. Somebody's got to be the next Black Mastermind Mark, Mark Champion. You could be the next person who discovers a cure for cancer in 20 yeah. years, 30 years' Absolutely. time. Absolutely, yeah. Why can't it be you? So that's the message. You know, I try to get... Uh, into schools as much you know I go up and down schools I'm going into a school and I get back uh, I'm going on tour uh, next week uh, to promote my book uh, and uh, but Chasing I always make dream. yeah I always make uh, 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 time to actually go into schools go into colleges go into prisons go into uh, institutions uh, where people uh, want to hear what I've got to say are passionate about uh, myself and my career and it's my way of basically using my fame and uh, 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 responsibility to try and inspire people to a yeah. uh, uh, better way of life. Because I know you've had support from your family, but I was reading that when you were 11, that one of your teachers said that you were probably more likely to end up in prison. Is well, that well, well, that was about 14, you know, because when you, when you start the GCSEs, that's when, uh, you know, you start your O-levels. And as I say, educational standards in 40, uh, 40 to 50 years ago, they had a low expectation of people like uh, you and I of colour in relation to uh, um, professions. 
you know, you expected uh, uh, as a young Indian girl to either end up in a typing pool or end up pregnant. Yeah. Uh, uh, my, so far as I was concerned, the best I could end up is either a car mechanic, driving buses, or working in a factory. Yeah. Uh, and if you had aspirations of wanting to be a doctor, lawyer, accountant, uh, th those were ideas way above your station, and uh, you know you were basically um, <clears throat> having uh, low, uh, higher expectations, which uh, didn't match your so-called ability. Uh, well, you know, I'm glad I won Mastermind as a black person because what it basically demonstrated is that. Uh, ethnic people, black people, Asian, whatever, we're just as clever as our white counterparts, if not cleverer. Because, you know, we're always told that we've got to work doubly harder, uh, uh, we've got to uh, use uh, education if you want to actually uh, uh, get, uh, get by in life. And that's the message which I always put across to young people. Education is the key. It's the tool which will uh, help you uh, achieve anything you want in life. And the one thing about the mind is this. You feed the mind with information, your information, uh, your mind will grow, your in intellect will grow, uh, uh, your thought of reason will grow. Uh, and that's why you're never too old to learn, you're never too old to actually study. Uh, and, you know, I love learning, uh, even, I'm going to be 60 next year, uh, and I love learning, uh, uh, feeding my mind with definite information because it keeps me young, it keeps me fresh, it keeps me sort of motivated, it keeps me focused. So if you always use information, uh, uh, and I always say to people, no information is useless information because one day you may know something which could completely change your life. Now, what I mean, you don't like be call, being called a role model, do you? I no, mean, no. What is and it? And the reason you... why uh, is because I'm human just like anybody else, and I've made mistakes in life, even in my adult life. And you know, we all have uh, human frailties. And the one thing about when you're in the public eye uh, uh, and uh, have this sort of uh, uh, celebrity fame. The minute you make that mistake, the minute you have that block in your landscape, the public could quick to turn you down. So you know what? I'm comfortable uh, sitting on the floor, uh, and um, you know, because it's a for, it's a it's a further place to fall if you do have that uh, mistake. So I see myself as a goal model, not a role model. It's a goal model. Yeah. Now, what is it that young people or we can do as a community to s support young people to break the status? quote as it were I mean I think when you were 11 years old the first letter you wrote was to the bar is that That's right yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah. what is it that we could do to inspire you know the young uh, as I say our, um, lies as uh, um, for young people completely different uh, 40 to 50 years ago you had youth clubs you had yeah. uh, uh, places where young people could congregate uh, and you know um, didn't have that sort of feral behavior in relation to uh, uh, the attitude that young people have now they see life uh, especially uh, uh, young boys who are part of gangs I mean, sometimes even young girls are part of gangs uh, you know they see life as cheap and meaningless uh, and uh, um, it's really really and social media has a lot to play you know we didn't have social media or the internet back yeah. uh, 40 to 50 years ago uh, so, you know, there's a lot of factors in relation to uh, the difference between the generations as to, as, uh, as to why uh, there appears to be a, a dramatic increase in relation to, uh, you know, antisocial behaviour. All we can do uh, is to try and um, give as much support as we possibly can uh, to our youth, young youth. And I always try to say to young people is this, you represent the future. You're going to be uh, uh, the next people who... Uh, uh, are in charge of the generation in 10, 20, even 30 years' time. And you've got to look at that uh, in terms of wanting to be uh, somebody, wanting to be a leader of your community. And if you do listen to uh, you know people who always have your interests at heart, then you will uh, uh, achieve those dreams and ambitions. Now, it, that leads nicely on to the autobiography that you've just re released again, Chasing the Dream, mm -hmm. do buy it if you haven't yeah. already yeah. done so. Where did that all come from? Where did that, in, you know... Right, it started and finished uh, when I lost the Eggheads Grand Final in 2008, and I'm sitting in my car uh, listening to Steely Dan's uh, Greatest Hits, wondering where it all went wrong, because that was my first uh, defeat in a quiz show in five years. And I'm sort of reflecting on my life up until that point. And, you know, uh, and I sat there for a whole hour. Was this before you started the, the chase? Cha yeah, absolutely before okay. I started the chase. Because so you were the first tw uh, qu uh, chase quizzer, isn't it, in yeah, uh, 2008? That's right. that's right, yeah. So this was before, uh, so the book takes, t tells the first 48 years of my life, you know, from the minute I was born right up until the point I lost the AKS Grand Final. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, the reason why I wanted to tell uh, my story, I want people to realize that, you know, people see me and they think, oh, you were born successful. No, I was not born successful. I've had my setbacks, uh, just like everybody else, uh, especially uh, 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 sitting exams. I, and when you read in the book, uh, how many times I sat out of English language, you'll be wow. completely surprised. And I ended up writing uh, a, uh, an autobiography. So I want people to realize uh, that uh, no matter how successful you are, uh, may become behind that success has been the odd setback yeah. and if you do have setbacks in life remember this your life or your future is not behind you it's always in front of you. I know you did the autobiography and that's taken how many years now? That, to took, get... that took initially three years to write then uh, my computer crashed and I lost it all uh, and I was gutted because uh, you know I'm not very computer literate and I didn't back it all up oh. and uh, I sat in my bed for about a month wondering, oh, oh God's no. gone. But the one thing I realised, guess what? Moping about it is not going to get it written. So I started yeah. again. You started again. And then how long did it take to get it done? Three years. Three yeah. years again? Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. And yeah. you wanted it that bad that you put it all back in? Not so much I wanted it that bad. Um, if you're going to start something, as uh, you know, the old mastermind uh, catchphrase, you start something, you've got to finish it start something gotta finish it now your um co-chaser and haggerty was just in i'm a celebrity get yeah. me out of here is yeah. that something you fancy doing no, going forward re reality tv is <laughs> not for me uh, no never has been if a game show was offered to you do you think there's anything out there that might entice you yeah, to follow in her footsteps um if i was offered uh, listen um never ever look, look a gift horse in the ma uh, mouth uh if a, a, a an opportunity presented itself and I thought it was a, a very good opportunity then I'm going to take it if it if it doesn't present itself and it, if it never presents itself guess what I'm not going to go chasing it no absolutely no and obviously things are coming all for you now I think and you're heading in an amazing direction yeah uh, I've got to keep on going but the one thing I always uh, uh, say to people is this it looks successful now and I'm grateful for that but I don't take it for granted uh, I'm only as good as the last question I answered correctly and I'm only as good as my last closing speech as a barrister. I'm writing a history book called On This Day because I write an article uh, every week uh, in the Sunday Express called On This Day. So I, what I do, I take an event and, and I discuss it. So by the Sunday Express and you'll see what I'm all about. So I'm going to be writing that. Uh, it's about uh, event. It's about all the days of the year from January the 1st right through to December the 31st and I take an event and discuss it. So, you know, yesterday I was writing about Guantanamo Bay uh, when it was first opened in 1903 uh, and uh, it's important to ramification especially in the late 90s with the uh, uh, when it used to house all this sort of Cuban and Haitian refugees who were basically trying to flee their respective countries and more importantly uh, with the war on terror uh, with uh, um, September 11th and uh, how um, the uh, American administration uh, used to hold people uh, supposed terrorists uh, without trial uh, in uh, Camp X-ray, so you know it's it's things like that. I take a certain day. That's incredible, year. and that's is that one once a week or once a month? Did you say once and every single day? Oh, so, every single. Right, and you so write I, an article every single day. Yeah, so like, wow. so when I, I go to Jamaica every Christmas because uh, that's the only time I like to do my writing. I'm in a lovely environment. I can do my training in terms of you know I do about a thousand sit ups a day, then go for a run. Fantastic. Uh, and uh, then I write. Uh, so that's the way I, in which I get my work done. No, that's absolutely incredible. Thank you so much, Sean, for joining me today and sharing yes. this wonderful advice. And uh, we look forward to hopefully uh, catching up with you again soon and finding yes. out what else you've got going on. Thank Cheers you, for that. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Cheers. I'm just coming out the chambers now, following on from Sean Wallace's incredible interview. If you've enjoyed watching, then do subscribe. Thank you.